in another problem-solving excerpt from our Physics 132 class at Dominguez Hills, we're going to look at uh, a problem we left off on gradients. And I'm going to refresh your memory on a couple of problems we did with gradients and what gradients were, and then hit the problems we didn't do and mostly talk you through them, leaving the last little steps for you to fill in yourself. The gradient, as defined here, at the bottom of the screen of a function is a function of three variables here it is the x unit vector times the partial of the function with respect to x plus the y unit vector times the partial derivative of the function with respect to y plus the z unit vector times the partial of partial derivative of the function with respect to z the first two examples that we played with, and I let you do, people jumped in and got them pretty much right away. So I won't really review much about them. Uh, they're shown on the page here. The two that I had in the same set that I left hanging were a little more complex. The first one was the gradient of a function that was 1 over r to the n, where n is some number, and r is defined as the distance from the origin to a point. So it's the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The other was also a function just of r, not of the three variables in any random combination, but just of r. And it was basically what you might recognize as something called a Gaussian function of radius, a bell curve if you had one coordinate, but now we have three coordinates. So exponential of minus r squared over 2 times some other number squared, where I call that other number sigma. So those were the problems we were working on. And basically what we're going to talk through after a little review is how to deal with gradients, partial derivatives, when I have this function that's a function of only the distance from the origin and not independently the three coordinates. So when this came up in the class, uh, it was a couple of different days, but spring 12 this semester, in our Physics 132 class, it came up on day 19. So if you want to look for some of the context, you can look at the day 19 files, or the couple days previous to that, actually, as well. We had talked about partial derivatives quite a bit earlier in the, in the semester. When we did waves, I first introduced partial derivatives talking about linear wave equations. Uh, this is a very different use. It's the same thing. Partial derivatives are just derivatives where you treat other variables like constants. And in this case, all the variables are variables of space, x, y, and z. But I kept mentioning how there could be many spatial variables. I won't really deal with that today, but I am going to deal with that in some notation here, because it gets convenient sometimes. And the notation that I've got written on the bottom of this page, I've rewritten the gradient as a function of three variables, where I wrote our vector, not just the distance, but our vector, that's x, y, z, as the sum on the three variables of the partial derivative of x of f with respect to that variable times that unit vector. So I refer to the three variables as x1, x2, x3, instead of x, y, z. But it's the same thing. And the big sigma just means a sum. It's like the plus signs. It's the same thing. So I'll go back and forth between the two notations, and I'm kind of doing that on purpose, so that you get comfortable with looking at it either way. And you get comfortable with the idea that the sum it's just a sum. It's just adding things. And that whether I call these variables x1, x2, x3, and their unit vectors x1 hat, x2 hat, x3 hat, or I call them x, y, z, with unit vectors i, j, k, it's the same thing. So if we're going to do that, we're actually going to need a chain rule. The distance from the origin is explicitly a function of the coordinates, right? It's the square root of the sum of the squares of coordinates. 
the functions that I'm dealing with are functions explicitly only of the variable r. So I'm going to want to look at the derivatives of this r with respect to each of the coordinates. The partial derivative of r with respect to x is the partial with respect to x of square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Well, you know how to do that. You use substitution, where my substitution variable, which I generally call u, could also be called r squared, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And then the differential for u du is just 2x dx. You know how to do derivatives by now. It's your second semester of calculus. So the partial derivative of r with respect to x, I can write as dr du, du dx. And when I do that out, I get x over r. Now, two things to note about this. I've written dr du as a regular derivative because r only depends on one thing, u. So I don't call it a partial derivative. But I wrote du dx as a partial derivative. So it looks like I've mixed up notation with the derivatives, but that is intentional because of the nature of those variables. Again, with a lot of these things with partial derivatives, don't worry too much about what's written. It's probably what you would have done anyway when you crank through the thing. The other thing to note about the expression I have written here at the bottom of the page is that the final expression I wrote, x over r, mixes the variables. It's something we generally tell you not to do in math. But here it's pretty convenient because r is a placeholder for a kind of complicated looking expression. And we're going to go through and get a final result. And the final result will want to have only r's or only x, y, z's. But until we get there, it's convenient sometimes to keep them both and see how things shake out. Someone noted in class when I first wrote this that that is a direction cosine. When you first learned about vectors, you had direction cosines. Uh, that's something important and deep that I won't touch on further here. But it's a good thing to think about if you go on. And you will see this stuff in third semester calculus. So when it comes back, they'll probably talk a lot about that. If I start putting these things together, just using that part of the chain rule, the derivative of r with respect to x was x over r. Now, x was no different from y and z. Physically, it's not different. It's just a rotation. And mathematically, it appears the same way in the formula. So the results for partial derivative of r with respect to y and z ought to look similar. And they do. You can crank through it yourself if you want. But really, it's just a matter of thinking about algebra and saying, I could have called that thing x, y. That is, the thing that was x could have been called y. And I get the result I have written here for y. Same thing with z. These are useful. We're ready to attack the whole thing. That is, the whole notion of a function of just r. When I apply the chain rule now, I'm going to have this mixed notation about which things are partial derivatives and which aren't. It really is correct. And it really is consistent with what I did before. But don't let it worry you, because, you know, in your first examples, these things might be a bit confusing. The gradient of a function that is just a function of radius, notice that's not r vector, it's just r, the distance, is the sum, from i equals 1 to 3, I didn't write that in, of the unit vector times that derivative of the function with respect to r, and it's only a function of r, so it's a regular derivative, times the partial derivative of r with respect to i, or xi, sorry. Um, three terms, just like before, is just the compact notation. For any function that just depends on radius, like this, I can take that unit vector, pull it over on the other side, and I know that the partial derivative of r with respect to x sub i is just x sub i over r. Notice 
I've got two terms combined together inside the sum. That dfdi does not depend on the index. Think about what the vector notation for coordinates really means. When you first learned about vectors, the r vector was ix hat plus JY hat, j hat y plus k hat z. That's what I'm writing here as the sum from i equals 1 to 3 of xi times xi hat. That's what appears inside the sum I wrote earlier. And everything else that appeared inside that sum I wrote earlier does not depend on the index. Nothing depends on the index. I could pull it outside of the summation. What I'm left with is that the gradient of a function that's just a function of radius is the r vector over the r distance. Oh, that's r hat, the unit vector, times the derivative of that function with respect to r. You know how to do derivatives. You know how to do the derivative of, say, 1 over r to the n with respect to r. You know how to do the derivatives of, say, an exponential, even if there's a function inside the exponential and you need to do another substitution. Before I let you go on and finish the problem, I want to talk about how this makes sense. The gradient was supposed to tell us something about the direction of steepest descent or fastest change. That's what the direction of the gradient was supposed to tell us. For a function that only depends on how far I am from the origin, the fastest change has to be either toward or away from the origin. That is, in the direction of r hat or negative r hat sometimes. I expect on physical grounds, geometric grounds if you want, that the gradient then should always be along r hat. It should reflect the change only in radius because this is only a function of radius. So I expect that the derivative of f with respect to r appears. This is on geometrical and physical grounds. It's not just from doing the calculus, although we derived it from doing the calculus. Okay. Steepest descent is either toward or away from the origin. And toward or away depends on the sign, S-I-G-N, of DFDR. As I said, you know how to do DFDR for the couple of problems I tossed out there. So, putting back that original slide, I know that you can get to these results. You have to watch out a little about keeping track of your ends and doing your derivatives right, pulling r's out in front, or getting factors of 2 straight in the second one. And note that in that second one, with the exponential, the Gaussian, I've got an r vector there, not just an r hat, because an r came out when I did the derivative of f with respect to r. You know how to do that part. I suggest you do actually work through it instead of just relying on my saying this is the answer. But I wanted to leave you something to do. Now you got it. You got all the pieces, and you can use that intermediate result. The gradient of a function that is just the function of the distance, not r vector, but just r, is r hat times the derivative of that function with respect to r, it should say in that denominator. This was a mistake in the final slide, and I'm going to leave it that way uh, so that you can correct it yourself in whatever you do with it. Have fun with it. Go back, try to learn it. Again, if you like this video, you can like it, but more importantly, if you think you got something useful for the class, please like the video so I know about that. Thanks. See you in class.